Reading with your kids. Hola, Niho, Kenichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Jambo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast, coming to you from the beautiful subterranean Reading with Your Kids studios and the awesome Reedville neighborhood of Boston, Massachusetts. Speaking of awesome, we have an awesome show for you today. Our guest is the author of the Love Sugar Magic series. Her name is Anna Mariano. You know, speaking of awesome, I have an awesome time. I have an awesome time doing the Reading With Your Kids podcast. I get to speak to amazing guests, amazing, young, talented uh, authors like Anna, and it's wonderful. I get to talk to all of you. I also have it's uh, just an amazing, awesome time performing my educational magic shows. I love I love the look of joy and surprise when I have somebody up on stage and they become the star of my show. And I also love it, and I think it's awesome when I receive great letters from my hosts. Like, I, I just received this letter from Bethany Coito. She's a youth services coordinator at the New Bedford Public Library. It, it, she said, Gently was incredible. Our patrons had so much fun during our recent New Year's Eve celebrations. I would recommend Jedley's program for all public libraries. I would love to visit the public library in your community. I love to visit the schools that your kids attend. I love to be part of the special events in your community. You can find out how you can bring my show to your community by visiting my website and visiting our website, readingwithyourkids.com slash live, readingwithyourkids.com slash live. Joining us right now from Houston in Texas. Talk about a well-rounded guest. In addition to being a, a, a teacher, in addition to being an author, she's also a talented Quidditch player. And we're going to talk about that in a little while. But first, we're going to be speaking about her brand new, uh, the, the new addition to her Love Sugar Magic series. It's called A Sprinkle of Spirits. Please welcome to the show, Anna Mariano. Anna, how are you? I'm doing great. Hi. Thanks. How are you? I'm pretty great. I'm excited for you to be here on the show. Uh, our friend Sarah Cannon um, uh, told me about Anne and suggested that she be, be a guest on the show. And we're very, very excited to have her and to learn to learn about the Love Sugar Magic series. Tell us all about it, please. Sure. So it's a middle grade fantasy series um, about a family of brujas. They are witches who do baking magic. Um, the main character is Leo Legroño. She's 11 years old, and she's the youngest of five girls in her family. So in the first book, Leo is feeling kind of left out of her family's bakery business. She's not really allowed to help out the way that her older sisters are, and she just doesn't know why. So she does a little bit of spying on her older sisters, and she discovers that they have this secret that her whole family is doing the, well, um, the women in her family are doing these magical baking spells and making cookies that can, uh, you know, influence people's emotions or give them good luck or help them with certain problems that they're having. So, of course, she ends up stealing the family magical recipe book and trying to do some spells on her own. It goes very poorly in some cases. As it always does. As it always does. Um, and then she sort of has to figure out how to fix that mess that she's made and try not to get caught by her parents, um, which, again, doesn't always go great. Mm -hmm. uh, in the second book, which just came out um, a little while ago now, she's things have settled down a little bit for Leo. She's learning the family magic. Um, she's sort of smoothed things over from the, from the events of the first book. Uh, until one day she wakes up, and her her abuela, who's her, her grandmother who has passed away many years ago, is standing in her bedroom. That would be a surprise. <laughs> that, was, that would be a huge surprise. And Leo finds out that, um, you know, her grandmother is, like, tangibly here. She's not just a ghost. Mm -hmm. um, and that she's not the only spirit that's been sort of risen, come back from the dead, um, from the from the other side of the veil between worlds, 
and she has to sort of figure out what's happening, try and track down all the rest of the spirits, make sure nobody in the town finds out about this, because, you know, the bakery, the, their customers sort of know that they can order certain things that will help them, but it's sort of like a like a unspoken secret. Um, so, you know, having a bunch of dead people walking around town is going to kind of blow that secret wide open. So there's a lot of discussion in this book about, you know, what secrets are and how you keep them and why are they important in some, in some situations and also are they sometimes not important? Um, because Leo's kind of butting up against this idea that, like, well, we shouldn't tell anyone. And she's like, but we, we literally sell magic goods. So we obviously told someone at some point because who's buying them? Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, but we don't say it. And you should definitely not tell your friends about it. Um, and she's kind of, she's sort of butting heads with that idea that she would rather include more of the town and more of her friends and be more open about the, the whole process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love this. Being, being a professional magician myself, I, I, I love, obviously love magic and I love uh, that there's a fascination with magic. And I think it's really cool that, uh, you know, you know, one of the things that happens with, you, you know, uh, with my shows, um, uh, I, I've, I've thankfully I've learned how to be able to present my shows so that you know, the little kids love it and they just buy everything. And, and the older kids, is, I'm able to present it in such a way so that the kids who are in middle school and high school sitting down going, who know that I don't have magical powers are still <laughs> able to sit back and enjoy the magic. But there's this, you know, there's, there's this kind of, um, in between place, I think, where a lot of kids, you know, they, 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 they kind of understand that the stuff that they see people do on TV and see people do at magic shows, it's not real. There's a trick behind it, but they really love the idea that magic exists in the world. And, yeah. and I think that that's why kids love books like Sugar Magic. Absolutely. I think that's, um, I I was I lived in that space for a long time as mm -hmm. a kid where I was sort of getting to that point where I was like okay I know that it's not very likely <laughs> but at the same time what if and you know I I kind of joke about I would always do the you know you wake up in the morning you're like man I really wish I could just like grab that book so that I didn't have to get up maybe I'll just try maybe mm -hmm. I'll just see if this is the morning that I've developed my telekinetic powers or, you know, this is the day that I can turn the alarm off just with my brain. Um, and I feel like that's, it was really fun for me to write Leo because Leo actually starts the very first book trying to do that. Mm -hmm. um, she, she's like, you know what? I just really, maybe, maybe today I can turn my sister's hair into snakes. <laughs> and obviously that doesn't work for her. But, like, getting to have a character who wants that as badly as I did and then getting to give her magical powers was so fun. You know, it's I, I have a little beagle. He's he's asleep here in the studio, but but I think he's Aww. in that phase because he stares. He sits in front of the, the little cabinet where we keep his <laughs> his treats, and he just mm -hmm. stares at it. And, and he, could, he can actually sit there for an hour staring intently <laughs> Uh, with the undivided, you cannot shake his focus. He just stares at that. And I think he really thinks that he can do magic because eventually the treats will come out of, <laughs> of, of the cabinet yeah, and go into a, his mouth. You just gotta really focus your willpower. That's right. right? That's right. <laughs> I have a feeling that a lot of you, uh, are in the characters in your book. Yeah. I mean, I think. That's true of almost any writing that anyone does. I, I think fiction writers have it easy because we get to sort of distance ourselves and say, oh, it's the character. I, I didn't do that. Um, or I don't really have those vulnerable feelings. But, you know, if you're writing them, you have to be connecting with them on some level. Mm -hmm. uh, I always admire nonfiction writers because I'm like, that's so brave. Like, that's so much scarier. But yeah, I think any character I end up writing is going to have pieces of me, pieces of uh, my family, my friends. I kind of joke a lot about like I just use a I just use a blender. I just take everything from my brain and that I know from different things. And as long as I mix it up enough, then it's unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, you know, taking moments from my mom's life. I, I don't have any sisters, uh, but my mom has five sisters and also three brothers. Um, and so she came from this, like, very large family, lots of people talking over each other, lots of uh, sibling rivalry, sibling drama, um, sibling love, of course. Mm -hmm. So I, I take some moments of that, and I put that in Leo's life. I take some moments from, um, you know, growing up with a lot of cousins and to put that into Leo's life. Um, I take, you know, details from <laughs> details from my grandma's house uh, or show up a bit in book two, and my mom was reading it and was like, so that, uh, that butter churn. And I was like, yep, yeah, that's the butter churn. <laughs> Just sitting in the corner full of old pennies. Nobody knows why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have one of those in our house. Well, not a butter churn. It's one of those mortars and pestles that, that, Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. My wife had to have one. Right there. She said, every Puerto Rican household has to have one of these. And I goes, great. So we have this beautiful one. It's beautiful. And it's been sitting collecting dust and pennies ever since we were married. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, I'm excited. Leo um, is going to interact with one of those mocajetes in uh, book three. Ooh, ooh, except, well, you brought up book three, you brought up book three, so tell us, uh, give us a sneak preview of book three. Um, well, it doesn't have a title yet, which is impeding my ability to talk about it, and I, I just couldn't think of a good title, so I'm kind of waiting on people to help me uh, brainstorm, but I've been jokingly calling it A Pinch of Patriarchy, uh, <laughs> because I kind of wanted to delve into, there's, I've, I had two whole books to just be very, um, to really embrace this, just like, you know, the, we are a matrilineal uh, family of, of witches and, you know, kind of being really, just having her family just accept that and nobody, you know, acts like it's weird at all. Um, so I did want to take a moment in book three to kind of bring in an opposing viewpoint, bring in somebody who is saying, you know, well, why do you do it that way? And shouldn't you do it this way? Wouldn't it be better? Um, so there's, and then of course there's some threats to the family. Um, and yeah, so Leo has to kind of deal with um, the the issue of sexism that I have kind of kind of keep, kept her free of for the first mm -hmm. two books. Mm -hmm. One of the things I have to—I—I I, I, I don't know—it's still in an early draft, so maybe this will all change. Well, you know, I one of the things I—I I, I have to mention it, and you know, I've been—I um, was mentioning to somebody the other day where I think we're up to close to 450 episodes that we've had, and I've had the pleasure of oh, wow. of of talking to so many different authors and had so much fun, um, and through the magic of of technology. We, Anna and I are actually looking at each other. I, I apologize, Anna. I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do with this. But anyways, you, <laughs> you are so, there's so much joy as you're speaking about your books and, and lots of the authors who are on, they're happy about the books. They, they really enjoy them, but there's, there's just something, there's just a sparkle um that of, of joy that that's that's coming through the computer as you're speaking about your books it's i, I just haven't encountered it before and it's it's wonderful it really is beautiful oh well thanks i i really love this series because it is such a kind of joyful celebration of um a lot of things like but like primarily Mexican American culture. Mm -hmm. um, that was something that was really important to me and to um, my team at Cake Literary. My team, that's a weird word. Uh, <laughs> uh, the people that I work with at Cake Literary, Danielle Clayton and Sona Cherapocha, when we all first sat down and discussed the like possibility of making this series happen, um, they had kind of come with a basic idea and we were talking about, you know, because I, I don't know if you know this, but I worked with a packaging company. Um, to make these books. Sorry, I should have said that first. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so I worked with Cake Literary, which is a packaging company. They came up with the basic idea of what they wanted for the series, and then they found me to write it. Um, and so when, when I was deciding whether to kind of come on board with the project, we talked a lot about what we wanted it to be and why we wanted it on the shelves. And that was a big thing for all of us, was we really just wanted, like, a fun, adventuresome, like celebration of the culture of 
you know, Mexican American family in Texas. Um, I, it's set in a fictional town. The, the stories are set in a fictional town in Texas. It's kind of a small town, but you know, I based it very much on my experiences growing up in Houston, um, which is the number one most diverse city in the country. Um, and I've had some, I've had some reviewers kind of be like, so this is not what I imagine when I think of Texas. <laughs> um, and you know, they said it in a very positive way. They're like, it was very fun to see, but like, is this real? Are you just, and I was like, no, it, it's really real. <laughs> um, and hilariously, the, the imaginary town, the, the fictional town of Rose Hill, um, uh, I found out there is actually a Rose Hill neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It's not a it's not a city or a town it's exactly, but it's like a it's like a suburb neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, and it is very close outside of Houston and probably has similar demographic. Like probably is about exactly what um, I was imagining, which is kind of amazing and mind blowing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think just because I was writing about you know like. Like I said, um, Leo is someone who kind of is like me, mm -hmm. kind of grew up in a similar situation, um, you know, lives in Texas, comes from that culture of, uh, I guess, Tejanos or, you know, Chicanos or Mexican-American families. Um, we have lots of different names and we can't, we can never agree on what to call ourselves. Yay, Latinos. Um, <laughs> uh, and then we're still also in Texas because we're not as like, quick on the uptake is California. A lot of us are still saying Hispanic, which everyone else is like, ooh, not cool anymore. And then we're like, yeah, we know. But also that's what our parents say. So, you know. Uh, what, what you, because of all that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because I'm coming from that place and getting to write about that stuff that's really kind of personal and exciting to me, I think. And because the series is so, takes all of that stuff and puts it in such a fun context, I think there is a lot of joy that I've gotten to, you know, write this and I've gotten to publish it and that people are getting to read it. And that's really fun. <laughs> you know, I, I I have to ask, and, and again, it goes back to this joy that I'm hearing. I recently spoke to an author who, um, come, her, her mom was a uh, bicultural, biracial. And there was, as she spoke about it, she spoke in a way that there was a lot of angst and my mom didn't, didn't know which culture and she didn't fit in. And, and, mm -hmm. And and you have a completely different kind of outlook. You're like, yeah, I'm Mexican American, I got an Italian last name. We live, we're Hispanic, we're Tejano. I'm I don't know Latino. Make a mistake, but there's, <laughs> you know, you just kind of like, hey, I yeah, this is the reality. And it, I, I don't, I, I you know, I don't mean to downplay. My kids are bicultural, and um, mm -hmm. they seem to kind of embrace it the way you do um and and joke about it and laugh about it um do you is it just uh an an, an outlook a choice that you're making is it the way that uh the, the 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 two cultures that you belong to and the people that you live with have kind of accepted you uh, is that the cause for the uh, outlook uh, you know i'm just i'm just curious because yeah i know i'm interested in that too i think because as soon as you said the the angst side i i know what you're talking about. And I've had mm -hmm. those moments or those feelings before. Um, and actually sometimes, sometimes I write that side of things. Like actually in book two, there is a character who's bicultural, biracial, another thing that it's hard to decide which word I, to use. Because, I know. I know. Like, is Hispanic a race? Like, <laughs> well, yeah, we're not going to get into race. that. Yeah, that whole, okay, so. <laughs> that whole character. Yeah. Um, so there is a character like that and she, she gets, She's grieving in book two. Well, she's grieving in book one as well, but we don't get to see as much of her, um, that side of her. She, in book one, she's kind of just come back and is very excited about the magic too and is happy to be home, but like has, has some grief a little bit buried. And when book two starts, we, we do get to dig more into that character. Her name's Caroline. Uh, that character is grief. And part of her grief is tied with her, um, sort of like trying to figure out her identity and how she fits in with, being a uh, Costa Rican and also uh, like American white on mm -hmm. her dad's side. And, you know, now that her mother is gone, how does she still connect with that side of herself? Um, so I definitely know those feelings. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it's, I think part of it is that I have, like you said, like I have a lot of support, um, from my family, from my friends, from honestly, from the writing community, I've gotten like basically nothing but amazing support, which I know is not everyone's experience. And I think has, I think that the writing community has made a big effort, um, mostly spearheaded by women of color to be more welcoming of new authors, um, to be more welcoming of own voices, authors, or authors um, from marginalized identities, regardless of whether they're writing own voices. Um, I think that's sort of a new movement. And I think I I came in right in the middle of it. So it's been um, really wonderful to kind of have all that support. And I really hope that I'm, you know, passing that along to the next upcoming group of young authors. Um, But I think that's part of what's influencing me is that, you know, I've been very lucky with the support of my family and the support of my friends and peers and other writers. Um, And then also it's just hard to, it's hard to talk about these particular books and not be Mm -hmm. happy and excited about them. Like I was kind of given the like most fun assignment ever to, to write these books and like, um, even to, you know, to give them to my family and to get to hear how my aunts react whenever the aunt character comes in or, um, you know, the, the grandmother character was a tiny part of book one, but everyone really latched onto her and said like, Oh my gosh, I just love her. She's so, you know, great and so relatable and, and it's so nice to see her. And then in book two, she becomes a much bigger character. She's actually standing there alive towards the beginning. Um, so, you know, my grandparents were really excited about that. Um, other readers have been really excited about that. So I think there is something about this whole, the whole premise of this series that just makes you kind of feel excited and makes you feel like, you know, things are great. Yeah. Um, things aren't always great, but it is nice sometimes to have books that focus on the great parts of being mm-hmm. Mexican American as opposed to, you know, the parts that are a little more, you know, it's, it's Texas. We sometimes make laws that I really hate and we sometimes have, you know, uh, uh, things happening on our borders that Mm -hmm. I really really hate. And, you know, there's, it's absolutely valid to spend time thinking about that and to, you know, work against that. But then also sometimes it's nice to take a break and say like, you know what, also we're awesome here and we do awesome things and we have fun and we have magic. Yeah. So, and and I'm, I'm happy you, you look at, and, and I, I'm really happy you, you have a, a, a great perspective on it, you know, and it's like, yeah, that's, there's a lot of things going on here. And part of it is, you know, what I choose to focus on, but it's also a, a reminder to, I think, all of us to, to be kind and supportive to everybody in our lives. And because we don't, we, we forget sometimes how, how important we are to other people. And in, in when I say important, I, I don't always mean that that we're a positive influence. We're an important influence. Hopefully, we're a positive <laughs> in, influence. You know, and if, mm-hmm. if if we help our kids understand that it is important for us to be kind and respectful to everybody that we meet, then we can we can that important relationship we have with them is going to be a positive thing and, and hopefully carry through. Um, I'm really excited. I but but I can't not ask you about this 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 quidditch Quidditch. that you have i I, you know i read about it i know it's it's in that 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 famous series of books and (laughs) and i know people actually play it but but i know in the famous series of books they're they're like flying around and unless you figured out something how did how do you play the game how does it happen I'm so glad you asked that question. The question, (laughs) how do you fly, is one of my favorite questions. Okay. Uh, One of the most common questions that we get as Quidditch players. Um, And the answer is we do not fly. Okay. (laughs) We run with brooms between our legs, which is way more dignified, let me tell you. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, yes. So, Quidditch, Muggle Quidditch, um, started Oh my gosh, probably 15 years ago now. I'm not, I'm blanking on the exact date, but I think it was close to 15 years ago. Um, in, at Middlebury College. So, Vermont? Of I course. Yes, yes. Of course. 
Yeah. Is that the Northeast? All the states are small. Oh, uh, that's Northeast. right. Yeah, we're all, yeah, just, just lump us all in together. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it started there with some college kids who, you know, decided to be silly one day and play Quidditch, and they ran around in their quad. Um, and it got... You know, it sort of grew from there. A lot of other colleges started making teams, especially up in the Northeast. Um, the the colleges would play against each other. And then it sort of just grew from there. Of course, now it's in Texas. I, I learned about it when I was in college in Texas. Um, then I actually moved to New York. And that was a really great community for me when I'm moving from, you know, Texas, where all my family is, um, except for, like, some very extended... Mm -hmm. Italian family in Connecticut, but I don't know them. Uh, um, to moving to New York, I didn't know anyone. I was starting grad school, um, and so, it, and in a very small program. So I think it would have been really easy for me to just meet my. I think we had eleven people in our cohort. Meet my eleven people that were in class with me, and then never meet anyone else. Um, <laughs> but luckily, I was able to join the Quidditch team get some friends outside of that world, um, get some, you know, physical activity, travel around. I think I told you I g went to play some games in Boston. I went and played some games in probably Philadelphia. Um, so, But all, all those northeast cities, they just all look alike. They're covered with snow. The people are mean and angry. Okay, I understand. I get it. New Jersey, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, like, it was a great – it was kind of a great thing for me to have – when I moved across the country like that. Um, and then since, since, uh, finishing with grad school, I've actually been able to play a little bit internationally. I actually happen to have it on it today. You, um, I played the, or I, well, I traveled with the Mexican national Quidditch team to the world cup of Quidditch. Wow. I didn't realize we had a world-class athlete on the show. I think this is a first. Well, world-class water water person because I didn't actually get to play with them because I don't have uh, Mexican citizenship. Uh, but I, I stuck around. I helped with some some paperwork and, like, water, water duties. Um, and I helped with translation a little bit um, when we were in Europe. Well, that's fantastic. Well, I'm excited. And you know one of the things I'm most excited about? is that since you don't have a title for the third book in the trilogy or in the, in the series, mm -hmm. that you absolutely have to come back on when that is ready to tell us all about that new book. Oh, absolutely. I would love to. That's awesome. Um, I'm very excited to see because it is in kind of early stages right now. I'm very excited to see, you know, what, which things stay in and which things go out because I kind of, this is, we're not a hundred. I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I suspect that this will be the the closing book in the trilogy or in the in the series. Um, I don't know if you can ever be a hundred percent sure. Like I'm not sure how people know when a series is finished. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Um, but so I kind of threw a lot of things that I was like, you know what? I wish that I had you know included cousins. I wish that I had included uh, type one diabetes because my brother is diabetic and a lot of my aunts are uh, type 2 diabetic and I was just like you know what let's just throw that in there and see if that fits in once I get it in there let's put in some this let's put in some that um, so I'm very interested to see how much of it stays in that's really cool and I, I I, one of the things I really love when I talk with authors and, and, and talking with you is just this whole um, lack of control and 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 you are, are embracing that. It's like, yeah, I have these ideas, and eh, some of them might be there, some of them might not. I don't know. It's going to be fun to find out. Yeah, well, I think, you know, I have talked to people about, like, what is traditional publishing. Now that I've gotten some books published, people will come up and be like, okay, so what's the deal? How does How is this different than, um, you know, my little 11-year-old cousin who published – her poem on Amazon. And I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, and it really comes down to control. That's a big part of it, like self-publishing. And obviously there are self-publishing publishing books that are not 12-year-olds posting their poems on Amazon. I wasn't trying mm -hmm. to be dismissive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but people want to know because they know a little bit, like more often people know people who have self-published and they don't know people who have traditionally published. Um, and it it is, I think, surprising to some people how little control authors end up having. Um, about 
not everything. I mean, you usually have final say on, like, the text of your novel to some degree. Um, but, like, other things, you know, covers, titles, uh, things that happen with, like, sales and where it gets, you know, if it gets translated into any languages. A lot of the stuff, people will ask me questions and I'll just be like, I don't know. Say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do also love the process because it's so collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, and, like, when I say, oh, I don't know what we'll end up in, you know, I'm not saying that because I think somebody will come down with, like, an authoritative voice and say, you must cut this. Mm -hmm. But, like, working with my editor, Jordan, or with um, Danielle and Sona, um, as we kind of, like, work our way through these drafts, like, a lot of times working with other people, you end up getting much better ideas than you could come up with on your own. And people will realize, like, hey, this isn't working, and here's why. Um, so I, I like getting that feedback and I like working with other people and, um, it's, it's, you do definitely give up some degree of control and some degree of like having the final say, but I think in a good way, mm -hmm. in like a, mm -hmm. so that you don't end up with the room mm -hmm. directed, produced, written and starring Tommy Wiseau. Right. Well, you know, you mentioned earlier on, and and you find it, you, you seem to feel a little awkward calling your team. You're referring to these people you work with as your team, but it is, it is, it, it's yeah. a team, and uh, you know, it's it's team. And I I think that a lot of people don't realize that 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 whether you're talking about music, you're talking about film, you're talking about books, that uh, most of our most most beloved works of art are works from a team. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, it's so kind of comforting to have people that are also invested in the book, that are also trying to make it the best you can, the best they can make it. Um, like you really, because so much of the writing process is done alone. Um, not all of it. And certainly there are people who co-write things and all that stuff. But um, so much of writing is like, you know, you go, you sit in whatever little space you have. And you kind of shut out the world and you let the, you know, weird thoughts in your brain kind of end up on the page somehow. Uh, so it's kind of, it's very comforting for me, at least, to have other people involved in the process to be able to say, like, yeah, I wasn't totally off the rails here. I can, you know, have other people who are helping bring this to life and it doesn't have to feel like it's all, like, just me alone doing things. Um it's been really fun, especially things like, and you, people you don't realize, like the people who designed the jackets did such an amazing job. Uh, and, you know, their names are very, very tiny on the back, but I'm like, wow, like these colors are beautiful. These fonts are beautiful. Of course, the cover artist um, for my books, Mirella Ortega, she's super talented. She's done such a beautiful job bringing the characters to life. And like, I, I've seen kids that come up in, to either to me at events or like, you know, I'll be scoping things out at the bookstore and people are drawn to that cover. That's like a huge, uh, that's been really helpful in getting people interested and in getting people excited about the books. And whenever I do school visits, everyone's like, Oh, did you draw that? I'm like, no. Okay. But is it you? I'm like, no, <laughs> <laughs> but Hey, look at Morel Ortega's work. She's amazing. There you go. Well, tell everybody where they can f connect with you online and where they can find out more about Love Sugar Magic. Definitely. Uh, so you can find me on uh, my website, which is com. Super easy to remember because luckily there aren't a lot of Anna Marianos in the world. Um, and you can also find me on Twitter at Anna M is Boring. Not my best, but that's my name. Uh, <laughs> and um, the book is should be anywhere that you love to buy books. Um, Indie Bound is always a great place. If you're international, Book Depository will often ship to you. Um, whatever giant conglomerate website you normally use mm -hmm. is also fine. <laughs> um, Barnes & Noble, any bookstore, hopefully, uh, and if they don't have it, you should be able to request it. And yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And you can also, there's also, um, a link at AnnaMariano.com that will allow you to buy the books. Mm -hmm. That's cool. 
I've had such a great time um, speaking with you today, Anna. I, I Everybody should absolutely go out, check out the Love Sugar Magic series. A Dash of Trouble is book number one. A Sprinkle of Spirits is book number two. And we'll find out about book number three the next time our guest comes back to visit with us. Thank you, Thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be the author of the Hickory Dock Tale series. Her name is Linda Harkey. Hey, if you would like to be a guest on the Reading With Your Kids podcast, we'd love to have you. Being a guest gives you the opportunity to tell thousands and thousands of people about your great children's book. And we think that being a guest is fun. I mean, you heard Anna had fun. We think that being a guest is easy. It really really is easy and best of all it doesn't cost you a thing all you need to do is go to our website readingwithyourkids.com click on the contact button let us know about your great book we'll let you know the next easy steps speaking of anna we want to thank anna she was a wonderful guest i had such a fun time speaking to her i also want to thank my amazing associate producer fatima khan she does such a wonderful wonderful job with everything she does here at the podcast and of course we want to thank you thank you so much for taking the time to be here today please be sure to subscribe to the show uh, you can subscribe to us uh, on, on the iHeartRadio app or Podcast Attic or Himalaya or iTunes or wherever you find your podcast. We also want to thank you for, for, for making the world a better place by, by spending time with your amazing child and, and, and reading aloud to that child and, and giving that child all the love your child needs. We'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.